I had a sleepless night. Last night I couldn't sleep at all. I was so scared. I don't know how many cigarettes I smoked. Because I remember like last night like most of my friends were there at my place. Like they were just there like as they usually do. And they were busy like playing uh, PlayStation. I just wish like I could just press the escape button or if there was an emergency door to life, emergency exit, just go through that door and just go and be on the planet on my own. Don't stress about this thing. The closer we were driving, a few kilometers, like we were heading to the center, it was like I'm digging my own grave, you know. If he is natural, he asked me last night, right? Yeah. That I, I, do you want to do this? So I said, Oh, yeah, yeah, I will. Then I doubted that. No, I will not. I will not do it. Decisions like this, they're not made. They're, made, they're not made overnight. You know, mm -hmm. they were processed, and because you have to prepare your mind, your heart, and soul. Because the thing is this: if you just say you're gonna do it, and then you find out that what is sick, I'm positive. So now you have to struggle with how you yourself gonna accept it, and how you, how your family gonna accept it. You know how people that you are impacting gonna accept it. So now there's more question that comes afterwards. You can say I have a little bit of tea. I don't want to be alone here. It's my own benefit at the end of the day. Because like this is my life and I've got only one life to live. I might come from the smallest house, but I'm coming from the biggest home. My name is Pusiso Jali, but here in the township I'm living in, I'm known as um, Spook. I'm originally from Free State, which is in the center east of South Africa. But um, I've been living here for four years. So this is like my second home now. Masipumalele is found in Cape Town, Western Cape. So this was a forest, but it ended up becoming a registered township. It was the fifth township registered in Cape Town called Site 5. That's where the name came from, Site 5. But the people, as they united, they end up calling it um, Masipumalele. That means we will succeed. I'm from Kailicha, Cape Town, and I'm part of Working Collective Group. Mainly, most of our, our stories, like, we focus on our community in Kailicha, but not only in Kailicha, we focus mainly, like, in all uh, Cape Town townships. Like, Kailicha, like, is, is the biggest township here in Cape Town. So Kailicha, I think, is the place that you can get, like, everything that you want. If you want stories, like, from Black Sabbaths, you can get it from Kailicha. If ever, like, you want, like, uh, middle class, let's, you can get them in Kailicha. <laughs> And if ever if you want the poor of the poorest, you can still just get them here in Kadicha. In South Africa, you find a lot of segregation. There's places that are better, so they are known as the suburbs. 
that's where you find most of rich people living. So there will be white people, mostly. So people who live in township, there will be black people. Mostly they are regarded as poor people. Africans, especially as you find them here in Masi, they don't even know that they're poor. You come to them and say, you're poor, you don't have food, you don't have that, that, that. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm satisfied. They're always warm welcoming you. Even if they had the last food in their house, they're going to give them to you anyway, because they, they're a giving community. There's a lot of needs in this, in this community. I really felt that I wanted to be part of that. And we believe that the constants or the people that can be, you know, the, the assets, you know, people that can really uh, help meet the needs are locals. So um, I've been really working with men who have been reaching out to other men. I call them my leaders, I call them my friends. They call themselves mighty men of mercy, though, you know. Massey is really beautiful. We have a lot of issues in Massey. We have um, drug abuse, we have alcohol abuse, but the one that is really big is HIV. Africa still remains the epicenter of the AIDS ep epidemic, particularly this part of the region, sub-Saharan Africa, where over, you know, 70% of the inf new infections um, actually occur in this part of the world. And then more specifically, the hot spot is South Africa, um, where nearly 5.6 million people are living with HIV. That is the largest number of people in one particular country living with HIV in the world. So South Africa is actually uh, categorized as a hyperidemic country. We have on the adult population, about 17% of the adult population average mm -hmm. are living with HIV and AIDS. Just about 29% of pregnant women who go to antenatal clinics are actually HIV positive. Some of the provinces actually carry the burden of, of disease for South Africa. We were talking about a prevalence of coming up to 40% with some districts um, reporting above 40%. So, you know, coming up to every second woman in that district will have HIV. HIV is like many other conditions that disproportionately affects marginalized populations. And if you don't have power, you can't necessarily affect change that's necessary to prevent new transmissions and to treat the disease. You know, when you get there, you meet with the council. But then when you sit with the council and explain, uh, you know, the whole process and everything, so it's kind of, it becomes more intense, <laughs> right? And then they will ask you a question, do you really, really want to do that? So that's why you have to process these questions before you go, <laughs> you know? So then you are ready for whatever comes. But uh, you want to be ready done. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. You, you um, have you had HIV tests done before? I had one long time. It long, was long time four ago. Years ago. Four years ago. Okay. Yes. No. This is just for the records. It's here, okay. Mm. Um, yeah, it, uh, there are no results or anything. It just mm. says that it's well, so that it, from a legal perspective, you come into a clinic. So, your first name? Uh, S I B U S I S O Spruces. It's a beautiful name. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's a zero. Are you off the Yes. Which one? Yes. Both. <laughs> um, there's a there's a whole a questionnaire that we're going to go through. 
So it will be a personal one-on-one -on -one explanation. If, you, if, you've, if you've been living dangerously or if you've been living uh, with HIV in right. any way, if you've taken any chances or anything, yeah. um, that's what we're going to be taking a look at. How deep do you go? Pardon? How deep do you dig? Well, it can get a little bit hairy, but we'll, we'll see. I'll try as far as, to, far as possible not to get too deep, okay? This could be. Gay men have never heard of gay compromise syndrome. Gays with that illness look normal. Their problem is they've lost the ability to fight off infections and cancer. Of course, the main question is why only gays get the disease. In the very early days of the pandemic, um, even before um, people began to recognize that it was in existence, there was this whole knowledge around um, HIV being based in the US that it was a gay epidemic and, and all the rest of it. The risk for AIDS is not being a homosexual man, and the risk for AIDS is not any of the other groups. The risk is the behavior. By the time in the late 80s, and scientists really came to recognize that, oh, you know, people are, are losing a lot of weight, there's this whole, you know, the diarrhea, what we call slim disease. It took a little while before scientists would put two and two to make four. I lost, I think, a third of my primary school class during, during the 80s and early 90s. A lot of people lost, a lot of lives gone. My own activism around HIV was in the 80s, you know, I, and in those days, the issue really that we confronted was within an apartheid state, HIV and AIDS had really the great potentials of creating the division further and racializing it as a black issue. We were pursuing the issues around how, how do you really bring HIV and AIDS as a public health issues, de-racialize it, and actually deal with it as a human rights issues. We were dealing with on a race basis being black and white. The colleagues that we're working with were actually dealing with the issues around homophobia. In the early 1980s, this was a disease of people who, at that time, were on the edge of social acceptance, let's say. You know, men who have sex with men, people who were injecting drugs. But we had concurrences because both of us were really faced with a disease, which is dumb, doesn't know color, doesn't know anybody, but actually creating that fear. <laughs> I never really liked white people because of what happened. So when I was eight, there was um, all the black people in you know, the community where I was from, they were marching, recruiting everyone to vote for ANC, which is Nelson yeah. Mandela's party. But then there were like all these big trucks of white people came and police and they said, go home, you know, stop what you're doing. It was all the time. And so, but they didn't listen and they kept staying there. So they started shooting at us. So everyone was like, poor up running into houses that are like so Mark Raymond came and crapped me because we were watching the whole thing. She came and crapped me and ran with me in the room and then went to the bathroom and locked the bathroom and then she was moving my mouth because I was really threatened by what was happening now. Crime people are running and then all of a sudden it's like doo -doo -doo. So that's the memory I have of what people prison, everyone thought, okay, the king is back. It's time to take over the land. I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and hit white people and do the same what they did to us. So that's when I said, no, you don't do that. You forgive. People had wounds, and that's when I just said, cover them up. And yeah. it was like, you know, yeah, you had a wound yeah. and you just cover it. 
it's not healthy. Post-1994, obviously, we were grappling with the issues around what does it mean for the country. And then you can imagine that we've just celebrated the whole uh, Uhuru, and, and, and we think, you know, there was a lot of thinking around how the country is going to look like, you know, uh, the issues around the primary health care, what will be the change, and then suddenly being told that there's this big problem. President Mandela has attended his final cabinet meeting in Pretoria. President-elect Thabo Mbeki will announce the new government before his inauguration next week. I think at the political level, there were a lot of challenges. I mean, the president is on record as having questioned the idea about whether HIV AIDS causes AIDS. You see, when you ask the question, does HIV cause AIDS? The question is, does a virus cause a syndrome? How does a virus cause a syndrome? It can't. The feeling we were getting was that there was a lot of speak about an African solution. We're going to deal with this in our own way. We don't need the West to tell us how to deal with this epidemic. If the, whether they were even admitting it was an epidemic or not is another story. It seemed to me that we could not blame everything on a single virus. Him and his Minister of Health at the time, Minister Mantu Shabalalam Sima, their level of denialism was so severe and so high that they were causing the deaths of many, many people by not allowing them access to antiretroviral medication. And I think very soon we should be able to put some of these traditional medicines on the shelves so that people can use the traditional medicines and they are cheaper than the antiretrovirals. There was almost like an uh, unwillingness to believe science. It was as if science, we have our own science, you know. Thabo Mbeki was somehow, I don't know, he's going to make his own rules. Like science didn't exist here. <laughs> it existed everywhere else. And even when at, there were hundreds and thousands of people dying all over the place. I've got a brother who's HIV positive. Who's HIV positive and he contacted HIV in 2008. When I hear that uh, he got HIV, I had it strong, first of all. At first I was very angry. Like, how can it be like, be so stupid, go and sleep around without using Kono, especially like in this, in this generation. And he knows that this thing, like, is, is, is like, you see your face. You know, and there's also like we've got a hospice in our area where you see these people are dying of HIV. So like we grew up in that in that thing like when I was really small. It was down and out, very sick, extremely sick, and and the reason why like he got so sick was the fact that uh, he did not want to, to, to accept that he was HIV positive, you know. One thing that happens every day to to really grow bigger in mass and be contagious is um, we have what we call sangomas, which is traditional healers, traditional doctors. What they do is they encourage people to stop going to take their medications uh, as, as soon as they start um, coming to them for help. Because their medication has to do with um, with with uh, ancestral worships. So <laughs> A wetlands, no? Yeah, the green wetlands. Oh, dear one, dear one. Okay. Going to a clinic or a you know, seemingly modern or Western healthcare environment uh, is kind of renouncing this traditional sense of cultural identity. So that's where a big complication comes in as well because um, you know, people are just torn because they, they want to be honest and they want to uh, know the truth about you know, their medical condition, but there's these kind of competing truth claims like a, a medical perspective and then a traditional African perspective. It's difficult for people to know who they can trust. 
First thing that, that, that I need to tell you is that uh, as far as confidentiality is concerned, what gets done in here stays in here. All right, and it's your constitutional right. As my witness right. as you sat there. Yes, and it's your constitutional right for me to ask them to leave when we do the testing. Okay. So if I create a test then. If, pardon? If I create a test If you agree to test, <laughs> um, even for the conversation beforehand, you can't put in your rights to say, would they please leave? And I can turn the camera off too, just tell me and I'll put it on. Okay. All right, when, when we're doing this test, we are going to be using a, a rapid um, HIV test. I'm not going to open it right now, just in case you decide not to go there, Drew. My uncle went for, um, he went and tested by a local clinic. And what happened is he, um, the doctor told him that he is HIV positive. And when he, he was like completely in denial. When you got him, he said that it's, not, it's impossible for him to have got an HIV, you know. And then he went to a Sagoma. A Sagoma told him that um, he doesn't have HIV, he's just being jinxed by whoever. Sagoma never tell who the person is. So he actually believed um, the, as the Sagoma. And by then he completely refused to take the ARVs. My uncle chose to believe what he understands. That's in that case the, what the um, traditional doctor said. So he ended up dying because he refused to take the medication. Then in Toronto, 2006, in Toronto, at the AIDS conference, the exhibition stand for South Africa had garlic and olive oil and the African potato on a shelf. The minister was saying, you know, garlic and olive oil can manage your HIV while people were dying. You will see that the group that has been working on garlic, on lemon, because lemon has got a lot of selenium, um, so their messaging, or their mixed messaging, I think was detrimental to the, to the rate of the increase of HIV and the level. Incidence levels must have been, I mean, that was the highest that we've had. struggles throughout Southern Africa to ensure that we get drugs. We call on the PMA to announce the sale of AZT to the government at 180 rand per one month course for a pregnant woman or rape survivor. No! Viva! 180 rand! No! We used protest, civil disobedience and the court as well as fighting with pharmaceutical companies to lower their prices. They spend more on Viagra than they spend on our health. Community Media Trust started by Jack Lewis and Zaki Ahmed with the Treatment Action Campaign, which was a huge um, organization which fought for antiretrovirus to be made available in the public health service in South Africa. During a time of huge denialism by the government at the time, it started out as very much as a right to health, a right to live, because at the time so many people were dying. It was a very obvious, these are the medications that help you live with HIV and the government's not giving them to us. So we had to fight basically for the right to access to medication in the country. <laughs> After the years of denialism and the years of not getting medication, what that did was it spread the disease faster than anything else could have. I've only got the gentian. Ah, oh, here we go, here we go. Now it's far more likely that a woman would pick it up, or she's in, in, in much more danger of picking it up because semen would stay in the vagina for a longer period of time. Okay. 
cater if the man is infected. Hmm. Whereas the, the length of time that a pe penis is in the vagina and in contact with vaginal fluid is a much shorter period of time. Hmm. Okay, because the same semen stays in the vagina. Hmm. that you know the epidemic in South Africa is a feminine epidemic particularly at around the ages of 25 to 35 where the highest levels of infection happen in the females but that's the same across the continent what we call feminization of the epidemic in many of our societies, gender relationships are very, very important. Uh, the challenge is that if you have a gender relationship where women have, do not have a voice and they're not able to actually negotiate aspects of the sex and how that sex should actually happen, then you have a serious problem. It's, it's in our minds as women that I can't challenge a man. A man is a man. A man is the head of, of the house. So I think it's power when it comes to prevention or condom usage. Um, that's where power comes in because if a guy says, no, I don't want to use a condom, let's just do this. You will do it because you, you, he's the one who's bringing everything for you at the end of the day. He buys clothes, he gives you money. So you just can't say no. You feel like you can't say no. We've had one of the highest uh, rape statistics in the world. They did a study where one out of every four men that they interviewed in the study admitted to rape in one way or the other. Knowingly. So it's just, the, the stats are ridiculous. It's very, very depressing. And that's also, they're basing it on the reports. What about all of the women that don't report? You can triple those numbers. Women were never going to get to a point where they were going to be able to negotiate safer sex because of the sexual discrimination, because of the gender inequality, because of the second class status of women. There's still patriarchy and there's still male supremacy and it's still ingrained and internalized in us. There's still women who may not be commercial sex workers in my community, but are certainly transacting risky sex for something, whether it's a good meal or a place to stay, or just to have a man on your arm for a night, or to have somebody just treat you right for a little while, that we're still willing to take those risks because of those identities and because of those set and established uh, ways of being in relationships that we have not yet broken out of, regardless of the risk that HIV poses to us. It's about e economic independence. The levels of poverty have to change. Who earns money has to change. The level of education has to change. Until young girls are educated enough to get a job and look after themselves so that they can deal with those issues by themselves or make an informed decision then all of those issues will remain the same. Only once you have your own money can you say, no, I'm not going to sleep with you because I don't need air time. Because they know, OK, if I promise you that I'll buy her Brazilian hair, I'll make her beautiful than she is, then she'll go for me. That's why you see a lot of us, like, craving sugar daddies with a lot of money. Because we want to be beautiful. 
And I just think we are beautiful the way we are. We don't need extra beauty. Because without that makeup, then or without that Brazilian hair, without this weave, will a guy come to you? Okay, yes, a guy comes to me because of this weave. But what if I take it off? Take it off. At night. <laughs> And not now. <laughs> Don't be silly. <laughs> Most of the relationships are men, women, that men need to be part of the targeting around the messaging. So greater involvement of men, making sure that we've got gender equality as we program them. So what is our goal this men? What is our goal, right? What is our vision? I was such a ladies' man, quite a ladies' man. So I didn't really respect the woman. I didn't see value at that matter. So because of that, I would date a girl, and then it's a dating this one, I would look for another one, and then this one. So I really never respected them. But I was really looking for answers. I was really looking for answers and saying, I want something that can, can make me to be me. And to be a faithful, a faithful guy, you know, learn how to be faithful. I started having a group called Men Up, you know, Men Up. I call it Men Up. It's them say, we, we're tired of the way we're living. So they say, we don't want to cheer on our wives. And there's single man who says, we don't want to be, you know, messing around or slipping around. We want to be pure. The same thing you will do to your sister, do it to the woman you mean the street. The major social norms that we, we try to address, and these are difficult ones, are expectations around what women should be, um, expectations about what men should be. Um, those are very, very difficult to challenge the stereotypes of motherhood, the stereotypes of um, you know, a man being entitled to sex, um, being um, naturally promiscuous, etc. HIV AIDS in our context is no longer an issue of risk groups. It's not about people who are really uh, having sex with commercial sex workers. It's not about men who have sex with men. It's not about people who are actually prom prom promiscuous. It is really related to heterosexual uh, transmission. It's uh, long-term relationships, people who are cohabitating on long terms, who actually regard themselves as, as low risk, and in a manner then they don't use condoms, and this is really where the HIV infection is, is coming in. Do you use condoms? I haven't had um, any sexual intercourse um, for a very long time. But I used to before. I mean, before I tested, I used to, and this time's where I did it, you know? So that's why I was not sure what it happened. In our surveys, we ask, if you ask people if they use condoms, they say yes. Then, do you use condoms every time? No. So there's also this issue of, yes, I use condoms most of the time. But, you know, there's, there's some nights, oh, I've got my main girlfriend. I love this one, right? So we don't use condoms. But my, I use condoms with my other girlfriends. Like we call them spares and besties. You have your bestie, and then the spares are, you use condoms with the spares, because you don't know what other spares they may have. And it's totally acceptable to have a relationship like that, and then your bestie must, you don't use a condom because you two are faithful to each other, faithful. I think like people like, first of all, to be honest with you, people are cheating outside, left, right and centre, you know? Mm -hmm. We have this person that really loves you, you know? Who's there for you, who thick and thin. And then at the same time, there's this girl on the side who's always come with mini skirts, and, 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 and yeah, you're always like tempted, you know? It's not like you love her, you know? Just that like, just a shank. You know, and, and that is a problem out of that, and that's when the problem starts, you know, because it's just a shake now, and then like tomorrow, feelings develop between the two of you guys, between the two of you, between the shake and, 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 and you, and then after that, like for a very long time, like, you fall in love, and then like you live a double life, now you lie to your girlfriend, you also like lie to this side, and then the next thing, like maybe like, you see also another temptation. Thing. and the problem is and like, people don't know you huge, and all of that, and uh, you uh, I'm like, okay, Come to Papa. I also don't want to disappoint them. Maybe like make them feel as if like I'm a, I'm a loser or something. <laughs> so you're doing it for them? 
Yeah, we knew we. <laughs> no, we, knew no, we. no, we honestly did it. I'm a good alone, man, and come on. Yeah, he's so quiet. So what does a person with HIV look like? They look like you and me and everybody else until they get very sick. Um, people living with HIV infection, uh, you know, I at least during the chronic phase of infection, which in an untreated person can last maybe as long as 10 years, um, looks healthy. They don't feel sick. You wouldn't know that that person has HIV infection. Now, on average, most of these people then, I mean, if people don't get treated for HIV and AIDS, people will progressively become ill and progressively they will die. On average, it takes about 10 years or so for people to be very sick, probably after 10 years when they are sick, probably another two years if they don't get any interventions, most people will actually die. Um, when we're testing in a clinic like this, we're not testing for the virus, we're testing for antibody, antibodies. If you, um, if you, if you, if the test does come up positive and you're infected with the virus, it doesn't mean you're sick. Mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between being infected with the virus, having HIV, and actually being sick with AIDS. That's when um, something else will come along. Uh, you'll get, have flu, um, TB, and your body can't cope with dealing with more than one virus or bacteria or whatever, one, more than one illness at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's when the HIV virus it takes over. It really takes over altogether. Antiretrovirals is the term we use for the medicine to treat uh, HIV. It's a retrovirus, so these are drugs against a retrovirus, antiretroviral. How do antiretrovirals work? They prevent HIV from copying itself or replicating. HIV is a virus that has a predilection for binding to a certain very important cell in our body, the CD4 cells. And it uses the machinery of the CD4 cell to make copies of itself, and in doing so destroys those cells. These cells are the managers of the immune system. And if your CD4 cell count gets too low, which is what happens in HIV infection, then you become susceptible to a host of infections that normally wouldn't affect anyone with a competent immune system or a functional immune system. Antiretrovirals block that replication process in the CD4 cell and, allow, and therefore protects the CD4 cells from destruction and allows them to maintain at the normal level. In a person whose CD4 cells have been damaged by HIV and they have a very low count, by taking this medicine, their CD4 cells can replicate and grow back to near normal levels. Uh, it's very much like a Lazarus effect. You, know, you have these people who are near death, very low CD4 cell counts, and then with potent therapy, their immune system is able to heal and come back. And then of course there was the groundbreaking research which shows that, you know, treatment can be used as a means of prevention. We know the science behind um, antiretrovirals is that they, they, they work in the body to reduce the amount of virus, HIV virus. So even when somebody's on antiretrovirals, um, the viral load or the amount of virus of HIV virus in the blood never goes to zero. It's always there, but it's at a level which we call undetectable, and it means that it's less likely to be transmitted to the next person. In fact, if you're on antiretrovirals from the very beginning, you will not spread HIV because your viral load will be so low. And there are PrEP studies now between um, serodiscordant couples, which is one living with HIV and one without. If a partner who doesn't have HIV is on PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis ARV treatment, all the studies prove that there's a 90-odd percent chance that they don't get HIV. It's not transmitted to them. So the whole idea is that, okay, if we can get a huge number of people who are living with the virus on antiretrovirals, then maybe we reduce the chances of transmitting the virus onto the next person. So that's where we're saying, okay, treatment as prevention. South Africa has got the largest ARV treatment program in the world. Um, 1.5 million people to date have ever been started on, on to ARVs. The government has already made provision that every South African who's eligible to treatment, who will have a free treatment for the rest of their lives. First and foremost is HIV testing. People have to know they have the infection to be treated and prevent transmitting to others. And they need to know if they don't have the infection to take advantage of prevention interventions. Early diagnosis is the key. 
And the sense is that if every South African have an opportunity to test and know their status, this is going to be the fundamental element that was going to make a difference in the HIV epidemic. You see, you cannot have the benefit of a treatment unless you know your status. Do you guys all know your HIV status? Yes. Yeah. 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 It was in, in, in March. Then after that, like, then I went back uh, after the middle period. That was in March. Why did you spend your period of my In July, I went back in June. Then it's still clean. Then after that, like, I am still until today. Yeah. Oh, I don't know that. He doesn't, he, doesn't know, he doesn't know that he's not lying to us, but he's lying to himself. <laughs> 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 Mr. Casanova. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you, though. The baselines are very difficult to predict, but I think that from the what we call the UN General Assembly Special Session reports that countries report on an irregular basis at any particular time it was known that only 10 percent of the population actually knew their status at that particular point people don't know because they never tested so and they keep they keep living life like they are negative yeah, if, you are, yeah, if you are negative you are negative you are positive you are positive we don't see even if you are not going to test mm -hmm. Mm. You've had an HIV test before, you say? Mm. Yes. And how long ago was that? Somewhere around May. Okay, and the results of that test? It was negative. Negative. Right. Just a few questions here that will tell us whether you're living a lifestyle that puts you into... Yeah, this is a fun party, right? A, 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 a risk assessment. You want me to turn the camera? No! Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I can step out. We can step out of the camera. No, it's okay. 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 It does get a bit here. Yeah. Have you ever... Um, Shared needles or syringes with anyone using drugs or anything like that, probably. So, I didn't use anything except for a mask here. I didn't use anything. Right. Are you sexually active? Are you sleeping? The... Yeah. When I first. No, I don't. No, I'm not. No. Okay. And have you been in the last um, 12 months? Sleeping? Yeah. No. No, I guess I'm not in the last 12 months. But... Yeah, I do different things, you know. <laughs> do you sweat at night? Mm. No. Okay, so you, you haven't had a fever in the last little while. Just I'm talking me. about a fever that probably stays there for weeks on end. Mm -hmm. yeah, but if these things are not there, then you don't have AIDS. Probably not AIDS, because it's, it's the, the, the signs and symptoms are not there for AIDS. At the moment, AIDS definitely no. Virus maybe, yes. In, in a recent um, HIV counselling and testing campaign, the aim was to test 15 million South Africans. But to tick a box and say that you've tested 15 million people or 10 million or how, how many ever is not enough. It's not just good enough to go for an HIV test once when government has a huge campaign and they aim to test millions of people. It should be something that's part of the social fibre of communities of going for regular HIV testing needs to become part of that social fiber. There was a, a general assumption in South African society that what we needed to do um, uh, to prevent HIV was to get everybody knowing um, how to prevent HIV. The logic was simply that if people know um, that HIV causes AIDS, that AIDS can kill you and that you can prevent HIV by wearing a condom or not having sex or being faithful to your partner, which is not true, but that if people knew that, that they would then change their behavior. Condom, condom, condom is number one. It's my money, my wallet, and then the last, the first thing when I open my wallet is a condom that I see. And using a condom, and what if it breaks, what's gonna happen? 
told you should buy condoms, not use the government condoms. You know. So what's the difference between a government condom and the one you buy? It's the same thing. It's the same thing, but the government condom is too thick. It's just like pump like three times, four times, and then maybe like uh, you try to change positions, and then it's dry. You know. And I don't like to play like dirty games, you know, people like, I don't have like the other life like to, 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 to play about, you know. This is my only life and I want to keep this life, live a positive life like so that I can create a legacy and, 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 and for the next generation to see, you know. So I need to play clean, play clean, play clean all the time. No. But you know you're supposed to still get tested every single I know, month. I know. That, that's, why I say, that's why I say I'm arrogant in that part because I know that play, I was supposed to be tested each and every time. Can I play clean and in what way, my friend? By sleeping with one chick or by sleeping with two chicks? Ah, uh, by using a condom. I uh, using a condom. Um, is there a particular reason why you don't use a condom? No. So, to do it break easily? No, uh, uh, it's not that to be honest, like, uh, you know how to use it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just sometimes it's in the heat of the moment, you just don't use it. Yes. Okay, that's, that's absolutely normal, I'm not surprised to do that. Okay, um, do you think that you've been at risk of being infected with the virus, either through sexual conduct, uh, using needles? that somebody else has used? Uh, no needles. No needles, no. not? Okay. Um, you don't think your partner's been unfaithful? I have no idea. Okay, now that's the second time I've asked you there, but that's good. Um, there were very high levels of knowledge around HIV, very high levels of knowledge, especially among young people, about um, what causes HIV, how you can prevent it, etc. And yet, their behaviour in all of the surveys that were done was still very much skewed towards high risk. And the majority of new infections were still coming from young people. So if, it's, if it was true that knowledge um, alone could prevent HIV, then we should have turned the tide on HIV about 15 years ago. Um, the fact of the matter is that knowledge on its own is never going to change behaviour. This is how we test. That, 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 <laughs> this is how we test. With the girls. We just make girls pregnant and then she must go and test. And if she comes back negative, then, you know negative. then I know I'm, I'm, I'm negative. <laughs> you know, this is how we test like in the, in the woods. Just make a girl pregnant and then... You know you are. If she comes back negative, then now uh, you know you sorted. You know? <laughs> and if she comes back like uh, uh, the plus sign, hey, it's a problem. You know? When's so, the last time you were tested, TV? Be honest. Uh, to be honest with you, it was back. Uh, uh, not two years back. It was oh last God. year in March. So you do? You do every six months? I I'm know. Due. I know. I, I know. <laughs> we did a literature review and some focus group discussions to see why, what were the barriers to testing? Why were young people not going to test? Um, and what we found is that there were four main fears that were standing in their way. Um, the first fear was, was quite simply fear of self-knowledge. It's knowing that you have done something that has got you HIV. So the, the knowledge itself of what you've done. The second one was, of course, you know, we're quite familiar with the concept of fear of, of death and dying. So, you know, AIDS is still associated, even though the treatment rollout has been so effective. Um, with with you know, illness and death. The third and fourth are, are, are closely linked and they're also quite familiar. The fear of, of dim uh, discrimination. Um, firstly, um, from your family, so that your family won't understand. You don't want to tell your family. You're scared of how they're going to react. They're scared of how you're going to, they're going to treat you. Are they going to throw you out of the house, etc. And then fear of the response of friends and community. So your, your, your social setting, um, reacting negatively towards you, denying you opportunity, treating you badly, alienating you, etc. If you have to confront the fact that you may be someone who's doing something that puts you at risk for HIV infection that the rest of society may not endorse. So you may be a man having sex with men, you may be injecting drugs, you may be a woman who's having multiple sexual partners, um, you know, these sorts of things. If that's a problem 
that you can't face and society is burdening you with that, it can make it difficult to go and get an HIV test. And once you have this form, it's your responsibility what you do with it. A revealing status is, is something that not everybody wants to do, positive or negative. Unfortunately, it does have a stigma. It's not like blood pressure or any of these other things. The real issue around the stigma with HIV and other STDs and unintended pregnancies and women's sexuality and all other kinds of uh, beliefs around sexual behavior and sexual expression is that the real stigma is around how we deal with sex, around how we approach sexual conversation, sexuality, sexual identity, sexual expression, sexual pleasure, all of that gets stigmatized. I mean. I guess because, again, it's connected to uh, something that is, in some ways, yeah, stigmatized or demonized, that, um, that the connection to HIV and AIDS is this idea of um, uh, like sexual promiscuity or having many partners and people are, are not sharing their status before they have a sexual relationship. We also have to make sure we're addressing the stigma just around illness. How we use or misuse the word normal in, in the context of health and well-being. So the person who's infected actually gets into this what we call personal stigma where you then stop doing things and going out and, and even seeking access to care. I know people who said they'd rather die than go and get treatment. When we have conversations about how are we going to end white supremacy, or how are we going to end white racism? Well, it's not going to be black and brown folks that end it. It will be the white folks for whom that racism is a benefit. And it's the same thing around feminism and gender equality, right? Women are not going to be the ones to end sexism if men don't end sexism among men. Well, it's the same thing. While the presence, the respect, the love, the acknowledgement, the celebration we have for the strength and for the beauty in people living with HIV who step up and step out. It's not up to them to stop the stigma. It is up to us. Would you take an HIV AIDS test? The, uh, sitting where I sit, again, HIV test or not, I think is irrelevant to the matter. It's, it might be dramatic and make newspaper headlines. But would it not set an example? president taking an AIDS test? No, but it's setting an example within the context of a particular paradigm. What I need for you to do for me right now is, um, after having gone through that, you wanted to test. Honestly, I don't know. I, I feel like it's still, yeah, I don't know. It's mentally for me because I made this decision that um, when I gain my, my girlfriend, then I want to go do this. So I haven't, so, but now I have a girlfriend in the moment. Okay, well, you need to go and think about it carefully because as a, as a role model, um, it is not a bad idea to, to have the that. test done. Being a role model and actually having the test done is one thing. Revealing the result of the test is another then thing another. again. Um, and you know, is, there, is there any thought in your mind that you might test positive? Is that, is that what's keeping you from testing? To be honest, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't want to think like, I don't know. But I don't okay, think. well I'm going to just mention, because that, that's some, sometimes there's an underlying, maybe I am. It is a scary thing. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Because I, I yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I just don't know, to be honest. What I don't understand in that one time is when people are dying, are dying of AIDS. Man. And then like, I don't understand like, why people don't like, just go and get uh, their medication that was free at the end of the day. So that's what I don't understand. That's what I don't understand. I mean, people don't want to be seen at hospitals. They don't want to be seen at the hospitals. And still, there's still denialism and then there's still stigma.
many people still choose to keep their HIV AIDS status a secret. Gugu Lamini was murdered after revealing her HIV AIDS status. I think of the stories of the bravery of women like Gugu Lamini, who was a young woman in KwaZulu-Natal who was fed up with the discrimination and didn't want to die in shame and in silence and disclosed her status publicly. She was an activist who joined the Treatment Action Campaign in KZN um, and then openly in a, some public event said that she's living with HIV and very shortly thereafter. First she was harassed, um, she went through extreme stigma from her community because she was open about her HIV status and then eventually she was beaten to death by her own community. It was, very, it was a straight up stigma related beaten to death because you're living with HIV. And I mean, that was, that was many, many years ago, and it was the very first TAC t-shirt that had Gugu Lamini on the back of it. So I always relate the t-shirt to her story. It's almost like that level of stigma caused that t-shirt, because we wanted to say, we're all HIV positive. Who are you going to beat now? You know, everybody's wearing one. We have to acknowledge and, and live in the light of what makes us different. But we have to do our work at what makes us common and what brings us together. And that's the same way that we're gonna address stigma in HIV and in sexuality and in people's rights and in people's dignity. When a sister sitting next to me who is just as fly and as beautiful and as engaging and doing, you know, all of her own ambitions, going to school, getting the job she wants, doing the work that she thinks is, uh, that is the career path for her, and then disclosing that she's HIV sends a different message that resonates with women in a different way. Our flagship television show is called Siang Noba, which means overcome in Zulu. So we started the show as a way to normalize just talking about HIV, talking about living with HIV. We tried to change HIV from being this, having the stigma of being a, the sexually transmitted disease with all the model issues that come along with that and try and normalize it to be just a chronic illness like diabetes, like high blood pressure, which can be managed and treated. If you see someone like you dealing with a health issue, it makes it easier to understand, makes it easier to absorb. Molweni, namkele kile kusenga ba pitit, inko ba ekutaza inte tonge zempilo, geze sondo, geze yobisi, ezo kuzinake kela umzimba, noko zipata. U pitit uchonga na nemitumbi ebalu lekile yonge zempilo ezo ni leto. Tingu noko bonga yawa, ndipila ne HIV. As people who are living with HIV, we're always faced with the challenge where we have to disclose our status. Talking from experience, like it's not an easy thing. hearing people gossiping around and the gossip will come and come and to my ears and people will come to me and say hey is it true that you're HIV positive or you hear people talking around like in, in groups and there was this day like I became like angry to a point where I stood on the street and I was like okay yeah I'm HIV positive <laughs> like get a life what's up you know because I know many of you, they are HIV positive, but you're sitting there looking at me, talking about me and my daughter. But for many people, like especially young people, teenagers, it's not easy. But as, as you're growing up, you get used to it. You, you get to meet people who are HIV positive. You share, uh, you share stuff, you share your experiences, and that's where you learn from other people. When I, when I was tested, I was at the clinic, uh, I was not sick. The sister asked me, asked me do, you, do you want the test? I said yes. She told me that before I test you, I have to do some counseling. I told her, I don't want counseling, I test me. I want, I want to know my status. 
Okay, she she said she do the test. Then we 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 talking, we talking. Now, after some minutes, she's not talking. I I ask what what he asked. She asked to me when you are when you when you are positive. What you gonna do? I said I can't do anything. If I'm positive, I'm positive. Okay, she said when the lines are like this, when the lines are like this. We are positive. So I, I said, okay. And I phoned my sister. I tell my sister, I did go to the clinic. They tell me I'm HIV positive. <laughs> and over the phone. <laughs> I want to make sure they are speaking the truth, really. Because I, I know myself, I was in Rwanda. I don't have a lot of lot, lot of boyfriends. I told myself I didn't go to Gauteng, to Gauteng and also to Cape Town and also to Deben. I was staying at home. Others they said they said the, the HIV is in Cape Town and Jobek. And I, now I didn't go to Jobek where I'm getting the HIV. <laughs> I think two weeks after after I tested for like I tested for HIV, I was like. How do I do with this? How long will I live? Um, will, my daughter, will my daughter be Asian positive as well? How will she look? You have those things going through your mind. Um, if you if you had to have the HIV virus, it's not a death sentence. Yeah, and there's a difference between having the virus and actually having AIDS. And having a general look at your state of health and so on, even if you had the, vir the, the virus, you certainly don't have active AIDS at the moment. Now, if you had if you, uh, sugar diabetes, if you had uh, high blood pressure, uh, TB, and you didn't take your treatment, and you didn't look after yourself, you can get sick and you can die. It's the same with the HIV virus. As far as that's concerned, there's no difference. I will ask the doctor. I want to know. I want to know how long I will live so that I prepare for my daughter before I die. <laughs> he was like, "No, you're not gonna die, Nogbong." I was like, "No, don't lie." I'm sure maybe that's why you say to a lot of patients because you want them to feel better. Just tell me when will I die? It's it, this thing. I'm sure it's like cancer. <laughs> he was like, "No." Then he started bringing me these people. Um, showing me Abu Zaki Ahmad. He was like, look at this kid. He's been living with HIV for this long. All those things. He's like, oh, okay. Now I see. I will say today I'm strong. I'm who I am because of the people around me who are surround me. Organization that surrounds me where I went and say, hey, I need information. I need to do this, you know. In, and even like young people who are having issues, those are the people who, who, like, who build Unokubonga, who I am, because I had to listen to them. I had to learn from, it, from them. Since um, I've become open, like, I've seen a lot and I've heard a lot, and people have shared a lot of stories. My name is Nokubonga Yawa. I am the host for saying about Beat It and I'm living openly with my HIV status. My daughter is negative. My HIV is, my, is, my, is, is for my HIV, not for my daughter. There was a guy we interviewed and he said, I think we are all HIV positive. It's up to you to find out if you're negative. <laughs> and I was like, that's as long a as good you don't thing. know your status, yeah. you are HIV positive. As long as you don't know your status, you're HIV positive. Actually, AIDS treatment in South Africa is completely free. So all we really need to achieve is to make sure that every single person in South Africa knows their HIV AIDS status. HIV is here. It's now. It's all of us. The more people who test and the more we normalize um, the whole issue around HIV, then HIV-related discrimination will also come down. I think for us is that you can't resolve the problem by biomedical intervention only. You really have to combine it with a very strong behavioral and understanding what people need to do. 
but there are also very embedded social issues that has to be addressed as well. So given the challenges of designing programs in Africa, how can we embed testing into the ordinary social fabric? So for the last 15 years, I've been studying peer-to-peer -peer influence and social influencers and how they spread behaviors through social networks and therefore through society. The science of social influence isn't new, but it's been going through an incredible transformation in recent years. Social influence was only observable to a very small extent prior to Facebook and Twitter and email and mobile phones that now give us data on not one or two people interacting in a conversation, but a quarter of a billion people sending messages that are timestamped to the second. That kind of data can really give us an understanding about how information and behaviors are diffusing through social networks. This newfound ability is giving us really a new lens on human behavior. And I firmly believe that we're on the brink of a scientific revolution and a revolution in our understanding of human behavior. That person there has had over the period of time three different partners. Mm. And those three different partners that they have even just had two each. Mm. Okay, and if you've had, have you had more than one partner in, your, in the past? Yeah. Okay. And you've got another one over there, and she maybe has two others, and that one has three, and that one has two, and they each have one, two, say so one, two, one, two, three. Um, can you see what's happening? Mm. Because in reality, what happens here now is that you're not sleeping with one person. Mm. and you haven't slept with one person as far as the virus is concerned. Um, that's you, but in reality you've slept in with all that multitude that everybody else has also slept with. Because the virus could have passed through any one or more than one of those people to get to you in the end. Um, and that's a scary thought. It's a very scary thought because... The, the it's a scary thought, but it's a reality. Oh, it's an absolute reality. The epiphany for us in thinking about how to apply the science of social influence to the prevention of HIV transmission came when we really thought about what kind of a disease or virus HIV really is. It's a social disease. It spreads through social contact, which leads to sexual contact, and that's the primary mechanism through which HIV is transmitted. So we said to ourselves, why can't we reverse that logic and spread interventions against HIV the same way the disease spreads itself, namely socially? Why can't we think scientifically about spreading HIV testing through peer influence and social influence from person to person to person? Social support has a powerful and unique ability to directly counteract social stigma. In the end, this is a social disease. It needs a social cure. The more we know and, and the more human connections that we make, the less stigma that we allow to, to flourish. So that's why I think normalizing conversation around sex and sexuality is really important. my African mama. I think, you know what happened in our community is that our community, our location is very small. So I think we've got lots of HIV because of that. And then really if you can come and talk about it and the other people are talking about it, everyone come and come. And then even the kids that are growing up, they can be very fluent about it because I'm, I'm really worried about the kids. Maybe they are not fluent. They are, like for instance, I'm the mother, I, I don't want to lie to you. I'm scared to talk about it to my child. So if someone like you... So probably don't like speak you, about it, right? Exactly. It's our culture, I can't help it. But even someone like you and you come and talk with her, she will know more than me because when you came in my house, I'm not talking about it. So I know there won't be something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why social influence is so effective is first that we trust our friends and family more than any government organization or company billboard telling us how we should behave. If that advice comes from our friends, 
uh, or family members, we're much more likely to trust it. Secondly, our friends and family know us so much more intimately than an advertiser or the government does. So they know how to speak to us in a way that will most effectively motivate us to change our behavior. And I think it's something that we're, like everybody really hungers for is that, um, is a connection with other people that's authentic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, th I think people are looking for voices. They're looking for a way they can uh, see the change that they want to see in their country and in their communities. That's why we're uh, looking for guys like this who will um, <laughs> be um, you know, social influencers, people who impact their community towards things that are life-giving, to, towards things that are positive, towards things that um, yeah, just promote healthy ways of living. So we've studied this question specifically. What are the characteristics of influencers in a society? And we have conducted multiple uh, randomized experiments on hundreds of millions of people to get at the essence of how social influence moves behaviors through society. And we've really done this at population scale. And we've learned several things. First, it's not that there are one or two or three popular influencers in the world. Influencers are all around us. Uh, they're in our schools or in our community programs. They are particular people who are looked up to at work. Um, they're you and they're me. Certainly there are people who are just naturally charismatic, you know, naturally open-hearted. Um, but then we've also seen people develop into that kind of personality and, you know, the big uh, the big indicators for that have been really a sense of personal identity, um, knowing what uh, people having a, an ability to understand themselves in context, and so they know who they are. Um, they yeah they know the the life they want to live. They know the change they want to see, and they're confident that their actions can actually um, influence that change. So. I started having a group called MENA. I've been really working with men who have been reaching out to other men. And they just meet under the trees. They talk about life together. They have, you know, they're accountable to each other. This is, this is the issue, right? This is reality. This is it. It's out here. It's our enemy. So I really want them to know beyond that, hey, you guys need to get tested because it's good for you. You know, it's good to know where you're at, you know? We're looking for local young leaders. We're looking for your friend, somebody that you look up to, um, your older brother or sister, somebody who is who lives in the same street as you, same social background as you, who's facing exactly the same social challenges that you are, but is responding to them in a different way. We're working at each and every day like we're making feelings and we try to change people's lives and we try to change people's perspective on how to view life and also like we try to heal people at the center with the stories that we tell. And we tell these stories that like, these are stories from Kailicha, you know. It is a place of, of, of dreams and dreams are possible to be realized in Kailicha. If ever you have like the, 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 the good support of people around you, like for example like my team, you know. But I still remember the first time I met, uh, uh, I, I came to know CMT. When I came in, I was scared, but as much as I was scared, I wanted to do this for the community, for the rest of the young people in South Africa, to learn from my experience and learn from the story that I'll be sharing with them. I will say today I'm strong, I'm who I am because of the people around me, who are around me. There's an old saying they used to say, when one hurts, we're all hurting, you know? When one is rejoicing, we're all rejoicing. So it's, it's more about them doing it as a unit. We should all, we should all, 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 treat ourselves as if we are all HIV positive, you know? Go there and support each other, you know? So that the next person next to you who is HIV positive, that, yeah, you know? Yeah, because like, if ever like, we're gonna say like, all is HIV positive, we should go and do that. Then like, we're still like, isolating them from the society. The entire society we should all be part of it, you know? Go forward, fight for it. So countries have to really take seriously this HIV prevention revolution that we are calling for and take it seriously. But it needs a number of, of actions 
and creating an authorizing environment where people are free, where people can talk liberally, where people can discuss sexual relations and their sexuality without feeling that they're abnormal in any way and an environment where HIV testing is normalized and integrated into the normal being well. We did a study, a randomized trial amongst 1.5 million people on Facebook to study how different types of messages spread social influence in a network. And what we found was that personalized invitations were about three times as effective as passive broadcast messages, like a status update, in changing people's behavior. The other big advantage to personalized invitations is what we refer to as stickiness. What's the likelihood that someone sticks with a behavior long after the influence message has been sent? It turns out that people are much more likely to stick with the behavior and make a habit out of it upon receiving a personalized invitation. By the way, we're going on Friday. We're going to all go get tested. I hope you guys come. <laughs> to be honest, okay, I will come. It will be a quantum leap. Okay, okay, okay. 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 <laughs> no, like, I should know, like, sooner than later. I'll be like, asking my girlfriend, like, for a very long time, like, we should go and test, we should go and test, we should go and test. Them. I asked them, mate, I said, you show, you show my guys. I said, you show, you show, you show, you show, you show. I asked them in there during the day, and they said, yeah, yeah. And I met them again, even. I said, let's sit down, tell me you show. Mm. And they said, yeah, sure. Right? And then they, they start saying, I'm scared, I'm scared. And I said, Mr. Dust, no. for high blood pressure, sugar, diabetes. Okay, you make it all really easy. Okay, so you've got that. Do you have any questions? I don't really feel like um, this was good. Um, questions you had. The questions you had were really good. So. Um, then that, that's it? That's all you are? Basically, that's it. Then you, you just need to um, decide then whether you want it to be tested now or whether you'd rather wait then and do it with your girlfriend or whatever. Yeah. No, I think I'd rather wait. You're going to wait. I'm really scared. I don't know what I'm extremely scared. I'm really, really... Like, even now, uh, I'm 99.9% .9 close to tears. I'm a filmmaker myself, you know, and I always have fear of things might always go wrong, you know, each and every day, you know. But at the same time, that fear, I always try to find a path like to overcome it. And at the same time, not to try to, 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 to run away from it. If this is the situation, then be it, you know, then be it. And, 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 and at the same time, like, uh, I think fear is not an enemy of progress, you know? What I need to, you to do from here right now is, um, after having gone through that, you wanting to test. Yeah. Okay. I just need you to put your name over there, your signature with a date. Um, you can just put your date of birth over there. And then just read through this, your signature there with a date, and that you're requesting counselling. Please. Have you been tested before? Yes. And how long ago was that? Uh, it's been a while ago. Four years, two years? Uh, two. Two. Just to have an idea, and you were? Negative. Negative. That's that, okay. You know the HIV status of before? Uh, the last time she also tested, she was negative. Okay. And that's a while ago? Yeah. 
because I wanted to come here with her, but she was also scared. And you're ready now? Yeah. Okay. You may fill in there. Can't seem for me, I want to ask you another question at the moment. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just prick your finger. I'm going to use this one. You tell me that this one has less nerve endings on and you don't feel it quite as much. Just a little prick there. Stretch off. Just the test takes about between 5 and 15 minutes for the result to come up. Now okay. it's doing that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of other things. Okay, so if you would say, if you think you've come into contact with the virus, you should test immediately. Three months later, and then six months later to be absolutely certain. Because you want to know that you're starting out negative and that you have a body already. Um, that just tells me where you've, um, that, that you do sometimes have risky behaviour, so you can have, could have exposed yourself to, to that. I'm extremely scared. I'm extremely scared. I'm extremely scared. I'm extremely scared. But at the same time, I think this is positive fear. You know, it's not a negative fear. It's not like uh, this will be my 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 deathbed or 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 or, 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 or my last supper or something. No, it's not. You know, it's kind of like the same thing uh, with women that says life starts at forty. You know, life starts at t testing on this uh, in this stage. You know. After you tested, like, and you know uh, your status, you know, you live a positive life, a free one. And if one line develops opposite the C, that's a control line, yeah. that means you're testing negative. If the testers work properly and it's negative, if more than one develops, then you're testing positive. Right. Right. If you were to test positive, what is the first thing that you would do? I talk to myself. Okay. My suggestion is that you find someone else you can talk to. Yeah. Somebody you can trust, somebody that you can speak to, because if you've tested positive and you share it with somebody else, it just decreases the burden on you phenomenally. Your, your, um, your body by exercising properly and eating correctly, um, you can live a long, healthy life. It's exactly the same with the HIV virus. Okay, and I know you're not hearing very much of what I'm saying, but it's necessary to hear it. Some of it will sink in and some of it won't, because it is a scary time and it is, it is kind of nerve wracking. Um, so I'm not going to keep your suspense all the time there. You can have a good look. Negative. <laughs> Negative. No, 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 Yes, 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 you! <laughs> if you're uncertain about something, um, that sort of makes you uncertain and doesn't give you, you, you feel as though you haven't got control. Mm -hmm. Basically what it does is, is, if you have knowledge one way or the other, uh, it, it does give you that, oh, I know uh, that I'm negative. Or I know that I'm positive, I know that I've tested, I know exactly where I stand. I know how to live my life from here forward. Uh.
I'm, I'm calling my girlfriend. I'm calling my girlfriend. Oh. Oh. I'm the man. <laughs> but no, but at the same time, no, 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 no sleeping around without a condom. It's like you said earlier on, it's like getting a fresh start. You, you just said it yourself. You, you're not going to take part in that risky behavior. That's extremely important now. Can I confess one thing? I lied when I said I did just before. <laughs> okay, that does happen sometimes, yes. This is your first test. Thanks to you guys. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> guys don't know how I feel. Huh? It's like a Good huge idea. burden has been taken off my shoulders. It's empowering, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. Oh, I wish I could take more. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it again? <laughs> I need you just to put your name there, sign there, and put the date, and then I'm going to put a stamp on it for you. Thank you. <laughs> Epidemic. What is evidence is that South Africa is making really great strides in trying to address this. I mean, obviously AIDS is a global problem um, and we're 30 years into the epidemic now. And in uh, fact, um, towards the end of last year, we, we developed a strategy as UNAIDS as we move into the future saying, it's now time to get to zero. And hence our new UNAIDS strategy, which is really around what we are calling three zeros, um, really aiming and saying it is possible to achieve and really target zero new infections, HIV infections, zero preventable deaths due to HIV and AIDS, and zero stigma and discrimination related to HIV. So globally there's certainly been progress over the 30 years, but there's a lot that we know that could be done. The reason the virus is, is able to survive so long is because there's a, a wrong perception, and it is wrong, that HIV is in certain communities and not mine. In the United States, a CDC estimates that there are approximately 1.2 million persons living with HIV infection. HIV is a disease that takes advantage of marginalized populations. You know, in the United States, it disproportionately affected men who have sex with men. Today in the United States, HIV disproportionately affects marginalized persons of low socioeconomic status, of color, and particularly people living in the Southeast United States. Here in Atlanta, about 87% of the women who are diagnosed with HIV are black. So that in and of itself is an immediate parallel to the burdensome role that women of African descent play in the global epidemic of HIV. When you have someone like a president, Tabo Mbeki, who was an AIDS denier in the early 2000s, and a lot of people can hold him, and his Minister of Health. We can hold them responsible for probably the unnecessary deaths of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Well, that's not that much different from what the gay community had to hold Ronald Reagan accountable for in the late 80s, for denying the fact that HIV and AIDS was a public health issue, that it wasn't just this issue of gay behavior, that he, up until just right at the end of his second term, was also an AIDS denier in his own way. And so the mobilization of ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and how that moved beyond Reagan and even into um, the Clinton years, even holding Bill Clinton's feet to the fire, if you will, was the same type of movement, albeit a little later, that started with the Treatment Action Campaign in holding in Becky, and then later holding Zuma and the next presidents accountable. All the member states of the UN got together, all 189 plus countries, um, saying that 
this is a possible vision, and a lot of countries worldwide have actually adopted those three zeros as their own national um, goals. Um, in order to be able to do that, we're going to have to do things very differently. On a trip to Tanzania, um, as I was um, walking through Dar es Salaam, I realized that every single person um, that I was seeing had a mobile phone. Even if you are a very rural, poor person in South Africa, you, do, you might not have access to clean drinking water, you might not have access to electricity, but chances are very good that you will have access to a mobile phone. We realized that there's this incredible opportunity to utilize the mobile technology platform and to deliver other services as well, not just promotional services. By using social methods and, and getting people to spread the message from person to person. You can harness the social effect of groups of friends and groups of people influencing each other in doing something really life-saving, like going for an HIV test. This is how we communicate today. This is how we get our information. These new social platforms are enabling our messages and our influence to travel farther and faster than ever before. We have to decide as a society if we want to harness this power to get people to click on Facebook ads or to make the world a better place. This is an awesome responsibility and we have to all realize that in essence we're all role models now. Interactions on a mobile phone can actually lead to real behavior change. Communities and social networks can actually influence the individual to take action. If you work uh, on a sustained basis in communities with young people, you'll see that that energy uh, is there, that development is happening, that communities are improving, that things are getting better. And a lot of that is sustained by this, by this social energy, uh, by the excitement of people together deciding that they're going to keep things going. And still today, like I spend maybe two hours or three hours before I go to bed replying on Facebook messages, um, BPM, you know, I kind of like it. I like it. Yeah, I like it <laughs> a lot. <laughs> you got to be able to stand up at the end of the day and do something for yourself. We used to have to count on governments or NGOs to spread the information that would generate social change. But the transition from corporate media to social media has made social movements accessible to all of us, even the most marginalized populations. We all now have the power to create social change in the palm of our hands and in our pockets right now. I, too, am an influencer. You, too, are an influencer. This is something that each and every person needs to do. As I said before, like, this needs to be like a part of, your, of, 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 of our lifestyle. You know, it needs to be part of our lifestyle. If ever like you wake up in the morning and, 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 and take a bath, you know, it should be something that you say that like, each and every three months I must go to test. You know, it should be something that that, 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 that you sleep, that you eat, that you dream, you know? When you convince one person to change their behavior and then they convince at least some substantial fraction of their friends to change their behavior, it creates a cascade or a contagion of HIV testing through the population. It's nice to know, isn't it? Yeah. It's a good feeling. <laughs> it's now time to get to zero. Zero new HIV infections. Zero discrimination, zero AIDS related deaths. To realize a future without HIV, we've got to get everybody tested and treated. Everyone has a role to play in preventing HIV infection. Get tested, know what your status is. If you're positive, get treatment. That's part of our personal responsibility as a citizen, every one of us. This is our platform, this is our medium, and we're going to decide what kind of culture we develop with it. Stigma can only exist where people are continuing to choose not to be informed and not to take that information to see, think, and feel differently about that information. 
the science of social influence and these new interventions have the power to spread positive social change at a scale that we've never seen before. By seeing someone from their community, it really encourages them to learn and to pass on the message because that's the idea for them to, to receive the message and not just to sit down with the, with the information but to pass it on to other people. So.